Hello and welcome to this episode of Triggered and True, featuring renowned emotional health consultant, Laura Duncan. Thank you for being here and thank you for investing the time to learn how to take care of your soul. If this podcast sparks any questions, feel free to submit a question by going to triggeredandtrue.com, scrolling to the bottom of the page and clicking ask. If you would like to learn more about Laura Duncan, we encourage you to follow Laura on Instagram and Facebook. Also, a great resource for you to consider is the Compassion Method Master Course. This course is a deep dive into Laura's life work, the Compassion Method. The Compassion Method is a process that empowers you to learn to see and comfort your internal pain and to discover your true self, your true self, that beautiful, wonderful part of you that has been there all along, but has simply been covered up. To obtain the master course, go to CompassionMethod.net and as a podcast listener, you qualify for a $50 discount that can be obtained by typing in the coupon code PODCAST50. Again, that's CompassionMethod.net coupon code PODCAST50. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Laura. How are you doing today? Doing great. <laughs> that's great. And today we are going to be talking about on this episode of Triggered and True, we are going to be talking about marriage. So, and we're going to be talking about the compassion method in the context of marriage. So I'm going to launch right in, Laura, and ask you uh, the first question. And the first question is, how does your approach to working with couples differ from traditional marriage counseling? That is a loaded question. There's actually multiple different reasons, but I'd say one of the primary reasons is that it's not so much about the marriage, which sounds kind of um, funny because it's marriage counseling and I'm doing it with both parties, Um, but it's more about the individual um, being connected to and then coming together in that connection in your marriage. So I'm really individual focused versus marriage focused. So is your approach to working with couples really that much different than working with individuals? Yes, (laughs) <laughs> yes, <laughs> because I mean, in some ways it's the same. Like if, if just the wife came in or just the husband came in, they would benefit from meeting with me one-on-one, but I believe it's in a greater benefit for a couple to come in and see the individual process of their spouse and be able to see their early childhood development, to be able to see what their triggers are, to be able to see where their pain spots are. Cause it really opens up the, you know, awareness that it's not so much about the spouse and what they're doing to us or not doing to us, but it's more about being able to see their individual process. And that's really valuable. Sometimes people will come in and say, you know, why don't we just meet one-on-one with you instead of together? And I really see a lot of value in doing the individual process together. Yeah. Cause then they can learn, they can get a better perspective of where, where their spouse is at. Exactly. We have a lot of assumptions of our spouse's triggers, but when we actually see the root cause of the trigger, it helps us be able to have empathy and compassion for our spouse versus judgment and assumption. So in essence, I think what you're saying is that the marriage is often the, it can be the, it's the cause of the trigger or it's a triggering event. The marriage can be a triggering event, but it's not the root cause. Exactly. And so by spending all of our time just trying to fix the marriage and um, work on the marriage, we end up almost blaming that and we are ignoring or not aware of what's going on in our internal world. Mm-hmm. So from why, from your experience, then why do couples fight or why do couples tend, you know, what, 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 what's causing the friction there? Your spouse is going to be the closest thing to your early childhood development the closest thing to your caregiver relationship when you were young. And so if we didn't receive our, um, our needs being met, or we would experience pain in our early childhood development, we're now trying to get from our marriage, um, what we didn't get from our caregivers. So you can see how the stakes are so much higher. We expect this person, you know, people even say you're my person, you know, we expect this person to meet all of our needs, to comfort all of our pain, to read our minds, to know everything about us, the way we wanted our mom and our dad to be able to give us. And so we come into, majority of people come into marriage already expecting their spouse to be their caregiver, not their spouse. Like their knight in shining armor? 
Yep. Knight in shining armor. You know, like when people say you complete me, you know, I'd be nothing without you. There's, there's a high stakes in that. That's saying that you're going to be able to do for me what I wasn't able to get. And ultimately what I'm not able to get for myself. Would it, I heard you say once that, you know, a lot of marriage counseling never gets beyond the triggers. Mm -hmm. So that, so what you're basically saying then is that a lot of marriage counseling is not getting to these things you're talking about. Exactly. It's very symptomatic. It's saying he said, she said, we spend the whole entire time trying to fix it, trying to teach you, teach the couple to validate, teach the couple to say things correctly, ultimately, so the other person doesn't get triggered. But if we tiptoe around and we just try to say the right thing and do it in just the right way that the other person can um, hear me so I can get my need met, then we're just avoiding and we're not actually recognizing that we're really looking for something bigger than just the symptoms. Because even when you perfectly communicate something, many times in marriage, you still feel empty because you thought it was just about being misunderstood, but you're actually scared. If we don't deal with the scared and we just work on the symptoms of being misunderstood, maybe at the end of the um, traditional marriage counseling session, you now understand each other but you still leave scared. And, you know, as far as the, the concept of the importance, you're working individually, but you're doing the individual process together. And one other thing that I wrote down that you had shared before, the more we can see their heart, our spouse's heart, or, you know, our person we're in relationships with heart behind it, the lesser the triggers, the less you see the actual trigger or mm -hmm. their triggered reaction. Yeah, exactly. There's, you know, kind of in marriage, you know, you're, you have your triggered self and you've got your true self and most marriages are having relationships with the, your, tri your triggered selves. So your spouse's triggered self is having a relationship with your triggered self. So we spend all of our energy trying to manage that trigger instead of being able to see the heart behind the trigger. When you see the heart behind a trigger, you are naturally going to have more empathy, compassion, understanding which in turn is going to allow you to be able to give to your spouse, as well as you're not going to be triggering as much because you'll be able to see the heart of it. You still have to take care of your individual trigger, but it helps you be able to see the other person's heart so much more clearly when you're seeing their true self versus their triggered self. I remember when I was first learning this, um, not too long after I learned it, my wife and I had a little altercation and I was able to, um, instead of seeing what I normally saw, which was this mm -hmm raging person <laughs> insert whatever words any this, marriage person has ever thought <laughs> this raging person i was like able to see like this, I, I was able to see a scared little girl mm -hmm. exactly because in a triggered state you literally are a scared little girl or scared little boy and one other thing that that i had written down that i've heard you say before is that just like we've talked about you know when we're talking about individual these triggers are a good thing because getting bothered by those things that our mm -hmm. spouse does, you know, and um, is good because it helps us get to these deeper issues. Exactly. And that's, you know, I remember thinking in the past, you know, marriage just feels like it's, you know, so challenging that doesn't feel like it's like a great idea. But then once I realized that when we are that close to someone, when we're so close to someone, you're living with them, you're sleeping with them, you're eating with them, you're doing all of your life with them. What happens is they become the closest to your pain out of anyone in the world. And if they're closest to your pain, that means that they're pressing on your pain, which just like you said, seems like a terrible idea just to have pain being pressed on constantly in a marriage and triggering and reacting and hurting one another. But really, if that pain, if that pain can um, be pressed on, if that person can come so close to our pain, that means that that pain can actually get properly comforted and cared for in a way that a lot of other relationships are not going to be able to get that deeply connected to the pain. Yeah, I hear sometimes people say, well, my friends don't trigger me like my husband does. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. A lot of people say that like before like, I was married, it never happened. It's like, well, you don't, if you're, if your friends became your roommates and you exactly. were with them 24 seven, it might be uh -huh. a little different. You exactly. Know? That's a common thing that I hear in couples that before I met this person, I never acted this way. I never treat anyone else this way. It has to be this person because this person's the only one that makes me react this way.
but it's just because that person got so close to your pain, it all came up to the surface, but it's really nothing to do with your spouse. They just got close to your own personal pain that hasn't been taken care of. Why does doing activities that encourage or sometimes force, you know, a lot of times marriage counseling or retreats, couples retreats, they're, they're trying to create connection. Yep. So you're trying to create connection. So why does doing activities that encourage or even sometimes force couples to connect often miss the mark? Because we're still in that management, you know, we're managing it by trying to teach connection. That doesn't mean we're actually getting to the true pain that's coming up. So we can, I mean, and and I don't think doing activities of connection is a negative thing whatsoever, but I also don't, I feel like it sometimes creates a medication in it where we can do this activity, feel a form of connection, but not actually be connecting to our true self. We're still trying to manage the trigger by having connected exercises, and we're not going to feel the level of intimacy that we're looking for. The byproduct of it, if we haven't connected to our heart, we haven't connected to our true self, is just going to be going through the actions, probably having a good feeling of connection, but then going right back to where you were before. Because a lot of times retreats and counseling, in the moment you feel great, and you go home, and you're right back where you started. Yeah, I think a lot of people have... For I've talked to people in the past, like a post retreat or post counseling, mm-hmm. like hangover type thing. Yeah, where, sometimes it's even worse than when they went, right. you know, because it stirred up some things, but it mm-hmm. never really got to those root, the root pain. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of shame connected to that because you had that kind of high moment. You did the connecting exercise and you looked at yourself, looked at each other for, you know, X amount of minutes. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I feel so connected to you. And so you get that kind of high that comes from those moments. But then because the root issue wasn't taken care of and that pain is still there, it's going to come back. Sometimes um, it's not going to Sometimes it's going to come back eventually. And then there's shame connected to it because you feel like you didn't do the retreat well. You didn't do the marriage counseling well, because if you would have done it well, it wouldn't come back. Yeah, so you, there's shame saying like, that that should exercise be should have solved this. it. Exactly. We should be beyond this now. We learned yep. better. We learned yeah, better. Yeah, exactly. And we even had an experience. So that experience should just carry us through. But again, it's a lot more managing it and you're managing your pain, medicating your pain but not actually truly connecting to what your real pain is and bringing proper compassion and comfort to it. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. And I think that that alone, what you just said could help a lot of people in their um, processing, working through their own shame. Yeah. Cause I feel like a lot of people give up because they try it. It works for a little while and then it doesn't work. And so they either blame themselves, they blame their spouse, they blame the counselor, they blame whatever it is because they're not feeling like they're actually getting better. They're just feeling that great moment, but then they're just going back into it again, which makes perfect sense if you understand it. But if you don't have understanding, it's really discouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that a lot of marriage counseling focuses on is communication, learning how to communicate. So connection and communication kind of go hand in hand, but it feels like those are common themes of a lot of, a lot of counseling. So a statement that you've made that I uh, wrote down uh, that you made before, you said, you can be the best person at learning how to communicate, but if you do not know what to communicate, you will get nowhere. Yeah. Want to break that down a little bit? Should I read it again? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Read it again. (laughs) So you're going to read it again and be like, I said that? Yeah, yeah, you did. Wow. No, just just teasing. No, I know. (laughs) Nope. You said this. You said, you said quote, quote, quoted by Laura Duncan, you can be the best person at learning how to communicate, but if you do not know what to communicate, you will get nowhere. And then just to make it even a little more intense. Oh boy. <laughs> if yeah, I know, here we go, we add a little bit to it. So if you know how to communicate and you are the best communicator in the whole world and you know how to communicate perfectly, but you don't know what you're communicating, it's actually a form of manipulation because you're able to actually communicate how, like you're being able to perfectly be able to communicate to the person to usually get the results that you're looking for. So it becomes you like, never, like passive aggressive. It could be passive aggressive. It's that feeling of you've now fixed your environment, but you never say what you really want to say. So a lot of times when I'm working with couples, I'll say, what do you really want to say? Not let's, how are we going to say this? but what are, what are you really wanting to say? 
and being able to help them connect with what they really want to say, even if they're how they communicate it isn't perfect, it's going to be so much more effective for connection because they know what they want to communicate, even if they fumble and how they communicate it. So essentially, you might be learning what to say to get your external world in order. Yep. We're really, we're just managing the trigger again. We're just, just, we're just, you're not addressing your internal world at all. Nope. And people get really good at it. There's all these catchphrases. Like I hear you saying, but, but when we say, I hear you saying, we're just trying to communicate so we can keep the peace so that we can communicate. So our external world will feel okay. We're not really sharing what we really want to say. We're not sharing our pain. We're just being able to communicate well enough to keep keep it at bay, to keep that trigger down within ourselves or keep the trigger down with another person. Yeah, you're kind of blowing my mind here a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but it really, I mean, because you have all those kind of catchphrases and all those things. And I've seen people communicate perfectly. I'm actually very impressed. The how they communicate, I'm like, wow. But they never really said anything. What's in their heart? Like exactly. what's really in their heart? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like that I'm scared. Yep. And in that vulnerability, you know, there's this big difference than when we're going through the proper way to communicate, we throw out emotion words and we throw out the right thing to say, but when you actually get vulnerable and you're scared, when you're able to get tender and you're scared, when you're able to share that in that very, um, very, you know, potentially, you know, exposing way, that's the moment that you actually have true connection. Even if the other person doesn't know how to connect with you, you just were able to extend a true vulnerable invitation for a real connection. Well, that sounds like true intimacy. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why you see. Yep, exactly. And that's what I that's why in some ways when people are just know how to communicate perfectly, it actually makes me sad. Because we have the system in place but we don't, we lack the vulnerability that comes from being connected to our true self and our, and our real pain. Sounds like it could also create a very easy way to blame. Like Mm -hmm. I can blame, I can communicate really well. So I can figure out how to blame you Mm -hmm. really, really, really well and blame others and blame the universe and blame whatever else. And it creates a superiority because now I know perfectly how to communicate. So if you can't respond to me, in in the same way, be able to respond back to me in that perfect way of communicating, then I feel superior and you feel inferior and we still miss the whole point. Well, my next question was going to be what role do shame and blame have in in our intimate relationships? And we're talking to quite a bit, quite a bit. We've already Mm -hmm. talked to quite a bit about shame and blame and anything you want to add more to that? Yeah. Just, you know, when I talk about shame and blame, a lot of times I talk about there's a villain in our story. You know, that's usually who we we want to scapegoat. You know, that's what blame is. I have pain inside and I don't want to feel it. I don't know how to feel it. So I'm going to displace it on someone else or something else in order to have a temporary feeling of peace. So you can see how in marriage, our favorite villain is usually our spouse. And so we have these villains that we've, we've kept record of wrong. We have a list in the back of our mind, consciously or subconsciously about what this person did or didn't do to make, meet our needs or to do what we wanted them to do. And so they're our villain. I hear it all the time. You know, when people talk about their spouse, they're the villain in their story. And that comes specifically from blame. And that's what we want to be able to identify Because if the person that is actually meant to be the person to be with us and we're meant to be with our spouse, because that's the primary purpose of relationship, we cannot be with our spouse if we actually consciously or subconsciously consider them the villain in our story. Mm -hmm. And would you say they're the villain just because they're the closest to the pain? Exactly. they're They're the closest to the pain. They have the most opportunities to do the wrong thing to reinforce how bad they are and have us avoid our pain. Mm -hmm. And And that, that should be a little freeing to people right there because that whole thing of like, you know, why did I marry this person? Well, Mm -hmm. it's probably less about the person or why am I in relationship Mm -hmm. with this person? It's probably less about the person and more about their proximity. 
Exactly. And that, and then, and then also whatever they don't carry within themselves, if we kind of refer back to the 10 gifts, so it's what they're doing that we want to pinpoint and say they're the villain, but it's also, if they have a lack within themselves and I have that same lack and I expect them to meet it, I'm going to feel even more upset because something in my mind, just like with my parents said, they could meet my need if they wanted to, but they refuse to, or they don't try or they don't care. So therefore, I don't get my need met because my spouse isn't meeting my need, just like my parents didn't, where your spouse was never meant to meet your need like that. Well, why don't you explain that a little more? Because I think that would be a triggering statement to some like, what do you mean my spouse is supposed to meet my needs? Oh, yeah. When I meet with couples, that's one of the first things they say. And then like they follow it with them, like, why are we even married? You know, like, why do we even get married if our spouse isn't supposed to meet our needs? This, this is hard. And if I'm not going to get my need met, why even try? It's a very common response. So to kind of take it back um, to the very beginning of getting, you know, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, when Eve was first created, that was the first relationship. She wasn't created to meet needs. That's what everyone thinks spouses were meant to be. They're need meters. Spouses are not need meters. You do not capital in need a spouse. Which is obviously true because people mm-hmm. can survive. And we're going to talk about being single here in a second, because being single is not an inferior existence. That's very true. So yeah, keep going. Yeah. So being able to recognize that there was no one of Adam's kind, he was the only human. There was no one of his kind to be with him. So God created Eve to be with Adam. The word that says that he was, she was his helpmate. So helpmate, the definition of it is to be with support, encourage, not do for. So if we were really full and all of our needs were met, we did the 10 gifts, we learned about our triggers and our pain, our pain was comforted, our needs were met, and we went into a relationship, we would go into that relationship to be with that person, to be with their true selves, for them to be able to see who we truly are and for us to be able to see who they truly are. And that would be the purpose of relationship. Yeah. And taking that a step further, they're in a relationship. People are trying to get childhood needs met as an adult. Exactly. That's a huge part of it as well. That's what I talk about. The capital in need. Those are always your childhood emotions, your childhood um, needs. And so it's like, we're frantic because we have this childhood need And I know we've talked about it before in the past, but, um, and you're always like circles and triangles don't get it, but, um, but I do use an illustration of if our childhood needs are circle needs and my adult spouse is triangle need, but I'm not in my adult brain. Remember how we talked about our frontal lobe being our sophisticated brain. That would be a triangle need that I'd have for somebody else. And that would be a lowercase in need. But when I'm in that frantic childhood amygdala response to my unmet need, then I'm a child in that moment. And I'm frantically wanting my spouse to meet my need like I, like I needed it as a child. So that would really be the equivalent of your, wanting your spouse to feed you baby food. It would be completely inappropriate for a spouse to feed another spouse baby food. But in, if we make that about our needs, we're wanting them to feed us. They're wanting us to give us that need that we didn't have met. But we have to be able to take care of that in our early childhood development so we can come back to being an adult in our frontal lobe. And then we can lower, lower in need each other versus capital in need each other. And you talked about the to be with. So one of the things I wrote down early on in learning the compassion method, and I put a sticky note on my computer and I said, the most powerful thing you can do for another person when they're in their triggered state is to simply be with them. Yeah, it is. Not try to fix, not try to meet their needs because you Mm -mm. can't, you can't meet them, Mm -hmm. Yep. but to be with. Yeah. And that's, that's what marriage is. Yeah. Is like, like you just said, simply to be with. Mm-hmm. So what you're defining when you have a situation, when people are trying to meet each other's needs, that to me would be the definition of codependency. Yeah. So how would you just kind of break that down? What you often see in relationships in this area of codependency. 
Yeah. So my real simple one sentence definition of codependency is I'm not okay if you're not okay. And I need you to be okay for me to be okay. You can also say the exact same sentence. I'm not okay if you don't give me whatever I'm looking for. I need you to give me whatever I'm looking for, for me to be okay. And so the whole relationship starts revolving around what the person can give to you. So your emotional attachment is not to who the person is. Your emotional attachment is to what they do for you or what they don't do for you. So we come close if they do the right thing for us. We pull away if they don't do the right thing for us. Instead of saying my emotional attachment is to you, what you do matters. But because I don't capital in need you to meet my needs, what you do is secondary to who you are. And my connection to you is always first with who you are and second with what you do. But in almost every marriage that I see, the emotional attachment in relationship is connected with what the people, what the spouse is doing or not doing, not who the spouse is. When we're not in a triggered state, we connect with who the spouse is. But in a triggered state, we're connecting with what they do for us or don't do for us. That's why we have to communicate perfectly to get them to do what we want them to do so we can be okay. Mm -hmm. And what you said was really great. In a non-triggered state, you can see beyond their behaviors. You can see that. But most of us, and in the marriage, we're unfortunately not more not, exactly we're yeah. usually more triggered than not triggered in marriage whatever the percentage is it's usually more triggered than less triggered so let's say that 30 percent of the time i'm not in a triggered state in my marriage that means i can see 30 percent of who the other person is mm -hmm. but and what we what we want to do is be able to take care of that pain so that increases that i see more of who that person is than what they're doing for me or not doing for me and vice versa. So I think, you know, what you're describing could be a little scary for people, a little triggering. Oh, it's scary. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's a whole system change, you know, it's your whole, you get a goal and a vision of what marriage is going to be. And now I'm disrupting it by what I'm saying. So at first, just like with any blame, it's going to feel very scary. And I think for a marriage to be, or a relationship, to be everything that it could be, both parties need to know and have a strength and a resolve that like inside of them to know that even if they were alone, they mm -hmm. could be okay. Yeah. And that's a really, really important thing to explore. And uh, something else that you've said before, you said people think that this, knowing that you don't have to be with somebody to be okay. Mm -hmm. People think that this will create a distance or a detachment, but it's not true. Yeah. So a lot of times people think, okay, now I've taken care of everything. So now I feel like I don't need the other person. So now I'm just going to go out and do my own thing because I don't need them anymore. But once you get past the capital and need for the other person, now you get to start enjoying that person, discovering that person, you know, starting to be able to see that person for who they are and, and each of us are extraordinary. You know, there's so much inside of us. I like to say there's a whole world inside of us waiting to be discovered. But because we're on such a base level of just getting our needs met, we're actually not very close in that. When you need someone, that's not love. When you want someone, that's love. And, and I don't want to say this to take it for people to take it the wrong way, but the reality is it's selfish really is. And it can look very non-selfish because here I am pouring my whole entire self out to meet your, to meet my the other person's needs. So it looks actually really good and selfless, but that's even selfish. The person wanting their need to be met and the person trying to meet that need, they're both selfish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People have to think about that one a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, meaning because, and I, I relate to this because I'm usually a need meter. So it looks really good for me to be meeting, you know, I'm not married now, but I was married for 10 years when I was meeting my spouse's need, that looked really good. I was selfless. I was sacrificing. I was giving, I was, you know, doing the right thing, but really I was frantic within myself because I didn't have my needs met and I actually get my needs met 
by making sure the other person's okay because I'm meeting their needs. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm truly loving that person. I'm just frantically meeting their needs so I can be okay. And they're frantically taking from me, not necessarily Jeff per se, but people in general would be taking from me to get their needs met. So we're both being selfish. And we're both not actually connected to our true self or our true pain. Well, and even though someone might be just a little comfort here, you might be doing something that's selfish, but it doesn't mean you are selfish. Exactly. No, it's a yeah. very good clarification. Yeah. You're only doing it because you're, you're hurting mm-hmm. and you don't know what exactly. to do. And you think this is what you need to do. Mm-hmm. And most likely in your early childhood development, this is what you did for love. So you just keep repeating it in your marriage and it feels like that's what you're supposed to do for love. And it was pr- quite possibly modeled to you. That's how your mm-hmm. parents interacted. That's how they exactly. rolled. Yeah. Yep. And so we think this is the system. It's been happening for generations. This is just how it works. This is what marriage looks like. This is what relationship looks like. And so we end up having our main goal and vision for marriage to be meeting needs. And we miss the whole point of marriage, which was to be with. Yeah. Continuing on with, with what you said. So this is you, you, you saying this again. <laughs> I like this. this is, I forget sometimes what I say. And I'm like, oh, I did right. say that. <laughs> That's right. When you don't capital N need someone, you can love more deeply. You can give more because you are not trying to protect the wound. And then I wrote, it's no longer all about you. Yeah, it's true. And now you can freely give because you're full, full people give freely. They're not poor, but when we're empty, we're poor. And so we frantically need the other person to meet that need. We cannot give the love that we were meant to give because we're not full. And then I think this was a mixture of mine and your words. So I think, I think we have an amalgamation coming up. So <laughs> that's, that's either fine. you said, or I wrote, <laughs> but this one, I can't directly quote to you. I don't think you are more your true self. Cause that way, if anything I'm going to say is wrong, I'm going to give you a pass here. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> or, or, you are more your true self. That's what love looks like. You don't have to be with someone, but you want to be with them. Yeah. You Co- choose them. Yeah. Yep. You choose them. Codependency makes it all about you, which is kind of what we just said. Your pain, your pain is running the show. Like all you can see is your own personal pain. Well, <laughs> that's that's kind of almost an oxymoron too because your pain is running the show i said all you can see it but a lot of times it's like staring staring at you right in the face but you can't see it because you exactly. don't exactly it's well, like it's invisible of, yeah instead of your pain being in front of you it's actually your spouse's face in front of you and that's all you can see is them but really it's your pain <laughs> yeah yep and your spouse is doing this or your your uh partner is doing this wonderful <laughs> gift this yeah. wonderful service to like bring this all up uh, oh yes they are it's the gift the gift of marriage <laughs> bringing up all of your pain so this one was definitely one that i wrote i said your personal pain blocks the view of your true self but also that of your spouse so i was just going to share a fun example of when i had an opportunity to see my wife's true self like really really vividly and i really attribute my ability to see it to this process so we, we were on vacation and um, I, um, she dropped me off at the beach and she was going to come pick me up because I was fishing and um, she forgot me. And I was walking back so that I just walked back to where we were staying. It wasn't that far, but she was like coming out of the condo and she saw me walking down the street and she was just like, the look on her face was just like so precious because like she just felt so bad, but I saw like her desire to serve, like her heart, like I saw her heart to serve and her heart to, you know, not want to do something that would, you know, like her heart, like this person maybe thought that I forgot them and that I don't care about them, but I saw how much she cared. So really, I think that's what I saw. I mean, I really saw in that moment, I saw in her face that that's just how much she cared. So um, it's like, how could you be mad? You know, I'm like, I could see so vividly how much she cared. 
But if you had been in a triggered state where you felt left, rejected, abandoned, right. that she didn't care about you, that she didn't value you, that you weren't enough for her, otherwise she would have remembered you. If you had seen all those yeah. things, yeah, not right. seen, I guarantee you the lens that you would have seen her reaction would have been different. Mm-hmm. And potentially because of you being in your pain without recognizing you're taking care of it, you might've even maybe seen that for a moment, but then usually we want to punish them because we are feeling all that pain that we haven't resolved. And so even if we can catch a glimpse of their true self, a lot of times we're not able to actually see it clearly because we're still in that pain place. Well, and you kind of hit on this already, but we talked about the the popular Hollywood dramatizations of marriage and relationships really run yeah. counter to what we're talking about. Cause a lot of what is being that concept of you complete me, or I'd be nothing without yeah. you. Yeah. It's like, no, you would be okay without that person. Yeah, you would be okay. You know, that doesn't not, mean that they're not important and valuable and or that your life beautiful would be, person to have in your life. Maybe yeah. your life would be less enjoyable or less yeah. well, adventurous or the thing, the wonderful things they bring into your life. But you know, and we have to know okay. that because exactly. none of us, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. No, exactly. And, you know, looking at yeah. like what you went through. I mean, we have to know that yeah. we could be okay, even if something horrible happened, you know, yeah, exactly. And most of us don't feel like that. And we consider that just to be centered around being in love, but a lot of it comes from our lack. Yeah. Uh, a quote you shared from a client, you said, uh, a client uh, said, I feel like when they were doing the the marriage stuff with you, they said, I mm-hmm. feel like I'm seeing you for the first time, like when we were dating. I know. I love that. That's like, sometimes like couples will come in and they'll be like, we didn't fight this week. And I'm like, Meh, okay, that's cool. You know, yeah, like, you're like, I, I don't care. And you're like, I wish you would have. <laughs> I, I wish you would have got triggered that we could have taken care of more pain. Exactly. So like being triggered, because ultimately that's what fighting is. Like we are going to be triggered. We have pain and triggers aren't bad. They're opportunities. So they're really telling me we didn't have any opportunities this week. That's how I hear it. Um, but they're hearing it like we're successful because we haven't had any fights this week. And I'm like, Can we get a gold okay, star you know, teacher. It's not like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So they're like, we did good. It's working because we're not fighting. And I'm like, yeah. Um, but then when and a client did say that, and actually multiple clients have said that when they say that they're seeing their spouse for the first time since potentially when they were dating, because in that dating time, we're able to usually see the true self easier because we're less triggered because we're having those endorphins being released of well-being and chemistry and connection. So it allows us to see the true self a lot easier. So they're saying since that time, I haven't been able to see the other person. And so when they say I'm seeing them for the first time, that's when I'm like, this is what it's all about. This is why I meet with people. This is why I help people see, connect with their own personal process to be able to connect with their spouse. Because what a beautiful illustration of true connection and marriage. I'm seeing you for the first time for who you really are. Not what are you doing for, you're behaving better. You're doing more for me. You're communicating better. You're connecting more. But instead, I'm seeing you. It's powerful. Well, in our, in our remaining time here, this is all really good stuff and should be required for anybody pursuing a relationship or premarital counseling. This should be like require, required information. <laughs> it would really help the beginnings and the vision for marriage. Yeah. Absolutely. But in our remaining time, let's just talk a little bit about for those that aren't in a relationship, that those are, you know, they're single or, you mm-hmm. know, or were yeah. in a relationship and are no longer divorced yeah. or otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, there's probably a lot of shame connected with that in some cases too, and feelings yeah. of inferiority and all of that. So what would be just some, some of your counsel to, because there's definitely a thinking, I think in, in, among some, especially culturally, that you have to be in relationship. There's like, there's yeah. something wrong with you if you're mm-hmm. not. What is wrong exactly. with you? Exactly. That's really common, especially in religious communities as well. But in any, if you, if you can't get in a relationship, there's something wrong with you. And then one of the biggest myths is I have to get better to get married. And I, that always kind of makes me laugh a little bit because <laughs> there's so many people that are married that are not doing better whatsoever. So like, you don't get married because you're doing better, you know, like you, anyone can get married, you know? So just being able to break that myth that you have to get better to get married. Mm-hmm. And uh, anything else you would say? 
Um, just kind of what we've talked about with the codependency of just being able to recognize that you can fully be you without being in a relationship with another person. That other person, if you eventually get in a relationship, can, you know, bring out more of who you are, be able to help you see more of yourself and you can see another person and have that beautiful relationship of connecting with someone, but you aren't less because you're not in a relationship and you're not less of yourself, your true self, if, because you're not in a relationship. And ultimately at the end of the day, it's not about the other person. Even if you are in a relationship, it's about you. And another encouragement is, you know, I was saying how like when Eve was created, because there's no one of uh, Adam's kind to be with. We have so many people of our kind to be with. And if we start to, if we're not in that franticness that I have to have a person and I have to have a person that's going to meet our needs, my needs in that way, you can start to get your needs met in multiple different ways from multiple different people that you can actually have thriving, healthy relationships and all different types of relationships that doesn't have to center around only having one relationship to feel like you're loved, to feel like you have what you need. And when you talk about getting needs met, you're not talking about those primary child needs. No, like yeah. I was saying, like to be able to have someone to talk to, to be able to have someone to, you know, help you with something or to be there for you or to just, yeah, to just be there with you. You know, there's so many different people that can just be with us. There's so many different people that can be a listening ear. There's so many different people that can help us with things. We have so many options and so many people, if our heart isn't so tunnel vision and focused on wheeling until we have that one person, we're never going to be able to get any of our lowercase in needs met. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Laura. This was definitely helpful for me and I trust it'll be helpful for our listeners as well. Yeah, it was great. It's fun talking about marriage, even though I'm not married at this time, being able to have been married and then be able to help other people be married. It's just, it's a huge thing to be able to change our mindset about it. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And until next time, this is Brian and Laura. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of Triggered and True. We hope that you enjoyed it. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, go to triggeredandtrue.com, scroll down to the bottom of the page and click ask. And if you would like to learn more about the Compassion Method, be sure to check out the Compassion Method Master Course, which can be purchased at CompassionMethod.net. And as a podcast listener, you qualify for a $50 discount, which can be obtained by typing in the coupon code PODCAST50. Again, that's CompassionMethod.net, coupon code PODCAST50. Thank you again. Goodbye.